Hello, my name is Matthew Mann. Uh, I am in the Faculty of Computer Science and I'm going for my undergraduate degree with honors. And as such, I'm here to deliver my honors seminar. And the seminar today is on anomaly detection on image data using generative adversarial networks. So let's begin by talking about anomalies. Data sets contain a set of data points which all fall into some characteristic set. For example, you have medical data, housing data, etc. So all of these will fall into some characteristic set. All of the houses will be houses. All of the medical data will be on whatever medical data it is. It's all characteristic. While data collection and cleaning are very often effective, uh, they are not always perfect. So anomalies can occur when incorrect or corrupted data points are allowed within a data set. For example, uh, today we'll be talking about image anomalies, so I figured an image example would be great. An example of an anomalous images could be a set of horses which contains a few zebras. So on the bottom there you can see a couple images of horses and there's a zebra. So that zebra image does not belong in the set and thus it is an anomaly. So anomaly detection. The idea behind anomaly detection is to detect incorrect or corrupt data points within a data set. After detection, these data points can be removed or they can be used for any other purpose deemed fit by the practitioner. For example, medical anomaly detection might be used to detect medical emergencies. Typically, someone's characteristics, medical characteristics, are supposed to be this, this, and that, as expected, but sometimes they can be off in unexpected or even dangerous ways. And so using anomaly detection, rather than trying to detect particular problems, can be a good way of detecting medical emergencies of all kinds. And so there are many, many uses for anomaly detection, and it's not just for cleaning up data sets, but it can be used for various different tasks. So it is assumed that a non-anomalous data set can be simplified further due to recognizable patterns and correlations within the data. So data points can be mapped to some lower dimensional distribution, then inversely mapped to the original distribution with minimal loss. For example, you can use an autoencoder. An example of this kind of reduction, this distribution reduction, would be, say, housing prices, where you get to see their, their price, their number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, and often those oftentimes those things might correlate with each other. And so they can be reduced into simpler distributions which will then better describe it in a much less dimensionality way. This mapping will lead to a new distribution where typical data points are more dense in certain areas than others. And as you can see from the diagram on the right, uh, this is an example of a distribution like that, where near the center there are, there's a densely populated area, and then as you go farther and farther out, there's less and less samples. So then, a rule can be asserted where the farther from the center of the distribution a data point is, the more likely it is to be anomalous. Or in other cases, the farther from the densely populated areas of a distribution, the more likely it is to be an anomaly. So in general, uh, there are two main problems with anomaly detection. So the first would be distribution mapping. So how do you map some high dimensional data to a low dimensional distribution that is going to be much easier to use and score as anomalies? And the second one is anomaly scoring. How do you score or classify samples as anomalous given the distribution mapping? Uh, so today we'll be talking about image uh, anomaly detection. And so we'll start off with problem A, which is image distribution mapping. So with non-image data, mapping data points to a distribution can be quite simple. Uh, using an autoencoder network to compress and decompress simple data points, like the housing example I said before, it can be quite simple, and then we can continue to use that as the solution to our problem A. However, with image data, the problem becomes much more difficult. Since the autoencoders are trained using reconstruction, their objective relies more heavily on individual pixel colors rather than high-level features. So the reason for this is because when an image is compressed and decompressed, its reconstruction score is very often based on how different is this pixel from the exact same pixel in the original image. And so what it will do is that it will learn the mapping and when it compresses the image, it will compress it only taking in the color data and maybe some simple lines and, and simple shapes and that sort of thing. And so this is something that is quite undesirable for us in anomaly detection. 
High-level features are what we really want, and high-level features are things that would be human-recognizable features. Things like objects, animals, um, different features like that. Things that are a bit more complex for pattern recognition. This leads to the mapping function using just an autoencoder leads to the mapping function relying on low-level features rather than our desired high-level features. For example, in the horse and zebra example that I gave before, we would not want to look at necessarily all the colors in it because there can be white horses, black horses, etc. But rather we would want to look at those high-level features like does this horse have stripes or things like that or what kind of setting is this horse in. And if it's not in the right setting, or if it has stripes, then it's probably an anomaly and it's probably a zebra. So this is where we come in with generative adversarial networks. So generative adversarial networks are something I've been working with for years, so I will give a brief explanation here of what they are. Uh, GANs, for short, are a deep learning architecture used to replicate dataset distributions, especially sets of images. So GANs are comprised of two parts, the generator and the discriminator. The discriminator is a deep learning classifier which learns to classify between real images and fake images generated by the generator. The generator is also a deep learning model. Uh, it takes a small vector, also called the latent vector, of random numbers from a normal distribution and transforms it into an image. Its goal is to generate images which fool the discriminator into thinking that they are real. Um, the generator and discriminator learn alongside each other until reaching an equilibrium where the generator then produces realistic images. So an example of this, or an analogy, would be an art critic and an art forger. The art critic would be like the discriminator, trying to determine whether a painting is real or whether it's fake. And the art forger would create paintings and give them to the art critic and try to fool the art critic into thinking they're real so they can sell them or whatnot. Uh, the art forger never actually gets to look at any of the real paintings, but the art critic can then go back to the art forger and say, hey, look at this little part of the image. It doesn't, this part of the painting does not look good. Here, you should probably fix this up, blah, 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 etc., etc. And the two can learn alongside each other until that art forger creates very, very convincing paintings. So I trained one of these generative adversarial networks myself for this presentation. And here it is as an example. I trained it on images of cat faces. And here are examples of outputs from the generator of images of cats. So let's talk about the mapping of GANs. So the points from the normal distribution or latent vector given to the generator create an optimally mapped distribution. Since the generator must produce realistic images, um, it uses this signal to represent high-level features such as the cat's overall color or shape as in like the color of its fur versus like the backgrounds or the shape of its eyes and where all of these features are being put and placed into the image and how it builds the nose, how it builds everything, etc. The generator only maps from a distribution to an image, however. While this is useful for very many use cases, uh, like, for example, if you want to generate infinite pictures of cats, uh, we don't need this for anomaly detection. What we need is the inverse. We need a model to map from an image to this distribution, not vice versa. So this is where the bidirectional GAN comes in handy. So the bidirectional GAN, or bi-GAN for short, uh, it includes one more model within the architecture. And this model is called the encoder. The encoder network maps from an image to a vector of numbers equal in length to the input size of the generator, aka the latent vector. Um, this is very similar to the encoder in an um, autoencoder, uh, but the way that it is trained is what makes it different. So the discriminator here has also changed from the original discriminator. Instead of simply looking at images, it now also looks at the corresponding latent vector. So now it must classify between a real image and an encoded vector, which is its, its pair, and a generated image and a normal vector. So you can imagine it has to either detect a real image that then was encoded into a vector, or a generated Im or a normal vector that was then generated using the generator. So then as the bigan trains, the encoder must learn the inverse mapping of the generator. If the encoder fails to relate its output latent vectors to the image properly, 
the discriminator will notice and penalize it for that. As such, the Bigans encoder becomes the optimal mapping for images for anomaly detection. It effectively maps images to a distribution which represents high-level features. In addition, the encoder will naturally map a simple normal distribution. Uh, it will map to a simple normal distribution in order to mimic the normal distribution given to the generator. This makes some of the solutions to our problem B from earlier, the scoring of anomalies, a little bit more elegant. So finally, let's talk about the experiments that I did with this. So uh, in my experiments, uh, we had a training set of 5,000 cat images. And this is what we used to train the, bi the bidirectional GAN. And then after that, we had 500 cat images, which are separate, and 500 dog images. So the 500 cat images and dog images are used sometimes in a classifier in my second method, which we'll get to in a little bit, um, but mostly to determine the accuracy of the anomaly scoring. So here the cat images would be non-anomalies, but something that hasn't been seen before, and the 500 dog images would be obviously anomalies. And then I finally have 5,000 wildlife images. These are also anomalies, but in the second method, which we'll see, uh, it has never been seen before at all, ever, hasn't even seen the class of wildlife images. So these would be anomalies that have never ever been seen before that we are then aiming to um, predict and detect. So first let's start off with anomaly agnostic method. So this method does not need to train any additional time on any of the anomalies. It doesn't need to look at a single anomaly. This only looks at and trains on um, cat images. So this scores each sample based on a reconstruction score. So what this does is that it will take the original image and then it will take the image and encode it and generate it using that latent vector that was encoded. And then it will take the reconstruction score. Here you see in that function is the f of x. And so that f of x is actually a feature extraction, extraction function from a truncated image classifier. This takes an image and returns the features from some layer in a pre-trained image classifier that knows a bunch of different image features, etc. This is a better representation of an image than simply pixels, although you could also do the same thing with just pixels if you so desired to. So the results from this are an accuracy of 73.55%, uh, you have 27.2% false positives, and 25.7% false negatives. So as you can see on the bottom right, it will come up with a distribution of anomaly scores for every single uh, data point and every single sample. And what you can do then is you can create some sort of arbitrary boundary and say anything below this point is a normal sample and anything above this point is an anomaly. And so the anomaly score then relates to how likely is it that this is an anomaly. And so all the blue ones are cat faces and we'll even enlarge this. All the blue ones are cat faces and all the orange ones are dog faces here. And the boundary was automatically set to maximize the accuracy. So then uh, the benefit of this model is that this doesn't need to train on any anomalous sample and so theoretically this model performs equally on any subdomain of anomalous samples. So that means whether it's dogs, wildlife, um, pictures of computers, um, pictures of medical data, everything like that, any subdomain of anomalous samples, this will work exactly the same on because it hasn't trained on any particular anomalies. Um, theoretically though, I mean some data sets are going to be a little bit closer looking to cat faces than others, but of course this is all, um, that that's, it doesn't need to train on anomalies. Finally, our second method and our final method here is the classification method. So here we do need to look at a few anomalous examples. Uh, a small neural network is trained on some bigan features to determine the probability between 0 and 1 that an image is an anomaly. So for this you need to have some anomalous samples which are labeled as anomalous samples and some clean samples which are labeled as clean samples. In order to not overfit to the specific anomalous samples, special precautions must be taken in feature engineering and during training. So here are the features that I used in this experiment. So first of all, it's something very similar to the reconstruction score, except that it doesn't square it. So it simply takes the difference between the original image 
and the uh, reconstructed image. So this subtraction makes the model ag agnostic to the original image's features and focuses only on how the network reconstructs those features. So let's say that these features were for some reason biased plus one or something like that, whereas all the normal images are zero. That would be something that would be indicative of the class. So let's say it's dog faces. That would be indicating that these are dogs, whereas you take that subtraction and then it's all solved like that. Uh, and so it won't necessarily look too, too much at the class. It will just say, how is this reconstruction? What's, what's, the, uh, what's the quality of this reconstruction? Where, what features is it messing up in this reconstruction? Uh, the second set of features is the standard deviation of the encoder's latent code for each image. So the encoder uh, outputs a latent vector, but it outputs two latent vectors, actually. It's actually a mean and a standard deviation for each feature. Um, theoretically, the higher the standard deviation, the less the encoder is familiar with that feature's value in the input image, uh, and the more likely it is to be anomalous. And all these different features, they might have higher, lower standard deviations, depending on, because sometimes the anomalies might have the same background or something like that, so it gives it all the standard deviations for all the features into this classifier. So some features may be more important when detecting anomalies, and the small neural network will be able to pick up on these differences to perform better. So finally, we can now look at the results from this classification method. So the different thresholds can be chosen for negative and positive images. Each sample can be scored between 0 and 1. Above the threshold is positive, etc., etc. Um, the novel accuracy here, that final column, uh, that is the true positive rates on wildlife images. Uh, the neural network was trained on cats and dogs, the 500 and 500, so again, small sets. Uh, not on the wildlife. So wildlife is something that it had never seen before, and it's an entire class that it's never seen before as well. So when we set the threshold to be 0 0.5, then we get only 6.4% false positives. So that's 6.4% where it it was an anomalous, or it was a normal image, and it detected it as anomalous. 11.6% um, false negative rate, so that's where it was an anomalous image, but then it, de it decided that it was not anomalous. And then the true positive rate the no on everything that it hasn't seen before on the wildlife images, its accuracy is 75.4%. And so those results are fairly good. And so to conclude this, uh, using advanced feature extraction methods like BIGAM with creative classification methods, outlier detection can be performed with reasonable accuracy. And I have demonstrated that through a couple of experiments and using BIGAM. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Uh, the references are all here, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. If you have any questions, please leave them in the YouTube comment or in UR courses. Thank you again for listening, and I hope you have a great day.